Thanks a lot, John. That was a great introduction. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's nice to see all of your lovely faces here. So you know, techniques for discovering topological structures in large data sets are now becoming practical. OK, I want to talk about that sentence for a second. Because I, I think this motivates partly why you might be interested in sort of the rest of this talk. So what, what do we mean by topological structures? Um, you think of think of a bunch of points, a bunch of data that you have, and maybe plot it in some space. Now you might ask questions about that data. For instance, does it is it separated into a, a few different regions? That would be the classification problem, which is fundamental to a lot of the things you do in in machine learning, in music information retrieval. You're trying to trying to figure out, okay, d is this thing the same or different from this thing? Now, to topologists, that kind of connectedness property is the least interesting version of topological structure. More interesting versions are to look inside one of these clusters and ask, for instance, are there any holes in that cluster? Or, or is it just uniformly da squished down to, a, to a, uh, a, a single point? So topological structures are kind of a generalization of the idea of classifying things. And I'll return to this a little bit in the musical context later. Um, what I want to talk about first, though, is how I got involved in this. Because I heard a talk by a guy named Gunnar Carlson. He came and visited my university, and I was sitting uh, in the last row, <laughs> kind of where you are. And he said some things that, that I found absolutely fascinating. And what I've tried to do is to transform some of those ideas that I frankly stole from Carlson from his image examples into a, mu a set of musical examples. So let me tell you what the image examples were because they, they make things very clear. And it, of course, it's quite visual. And we have a visual screen here so we can, we, we can see it. So, Let's think about a photograph. We all have computers with hundreds or perhaps thousands or even tens of thousands of, of photographs. And each of those photographs is a big array of numbers. Right? I mean, a typical size of a photograph might be a couple thousand pixels by a couple thousand pixels. What that means, if you think about it, is the photograph consists of rough, well, if it was 2,000 and 3,000, as I've done there, that means that there's 6, 000, uh, sorry, 6 million numbers in that picture. And actually, it might be three times that, because color is represented as red, green, and blue. But all right, let's just say six, 6 million. So each picture is a point in this big space, a Euclidean space with 6 million dimensions. Now, let's ask the question. Of, let's, let's imagine that we take a huge database of pictures, say, all the pictures on Google Images or something like that. And those, each of those is a point in this space. And let's plot them all. And let's ask some questions about them. Do they all sort of like cluster in one big clump? Maybe there's just some sort of origin somewhere, and everything's just near there. Or maybe they cluster into several different places. You know, maybe all the images of uh, forests are over here, and the images of cities are over here, and the Im and oceans somewhere else. Um, this, is a, this is a question that we can ask of our data. Um, I, I, and the question that Carlson's asking here is, to say it slightly mathematically, what is the topological structure of all of these points sitting in this large space? So that's the image that that I I, I took away from that from that talk, and uh, uh, what I did is I said, okay, let's replace images with songs, or performances of music, or uh, musical scores, or some kind of more interesting data, and ask the same kinds of questions. Now, what does Carlson actually do? Well, you know, computers are fast and storage is cheap, but R6 million is really big. It's too big to do anything in. So what Carlson does is he steps back from the larger question that he asked. And, and in his paper, well, you, if, you, if you want a good read on a, on, a, on a nice paper, I highly recommend the topology of data that Carlson, uh, you can find it on the web under, under that title. 
And what he actually does is he takes little pieces from the images, so little seven by seven patches. Okay, if you think about it, each each seven by seven patch is 49 numbers. So these are in R49, and R49 is the kind of size that's small enough to be usable in our computational machines, yet large enough to be interesting. Okay, so. What are, how are we going to do this? How are we going to take this idea of translating uh, our, our data into, into these points, which we can then talk about structure? So, and there's really two issues that arise when you try to actually do this. One of them is that regular topology, as you would study in your topology math class. Do you have a question? Oh, you just, okay, sorry. Um, deals with continuous type surfaces. You know, things like a Mobius strip you've probably heard of. Um, it's, there's got to be some way to get that and, and turn that into a, an ability to talk about data, i.e., you know, individual points, rather than these con connected surfaces. And what this leads us to is we, we need a notion of the closeness or distance between the points. Um, maybe that seems easy. But we'll see that telling how far apart two things are is not a completely straightforward, uh, straightforward idea. Now, as I was sitting listening to Carlson, it occurred to me that I could envision that there ought to be non-trivial topological structures in music. Okay, so I'm going to show you three of them. That are, I didn't think of them all at the same time, but so, so one of them's this. The first one is I'll, I just called it here the the circle of notes, and this is, I mean, you, you're sitting at a piano keyboard, and you kind of have two notions of distance. One notion of distance is how close the keys are, that is, how close in frequency the fundamental pitches of the two of the two notes are. And then there's another notion of closeness, which is the notion of closeness by octave. So all the C's on the piano are sort of somehow similar to each other in a way that's quite different from the way the C's are similar to the C sharp. So when we talk about closeness, we're going to have to somehow uh, have both of these notions. Uh, we're going to have to capture both of these notions. And now if we think about just drawing out the notes, so here's 12 notes around a scale, and you see that I've drawn them in a circle. Well, a circle is a topological structure. I mean, it's a simple one, but it's a topological structure. In fact, once you say the word circle, the very next thing that pops into most musicians' minds is uh, the circle of fifths. So here is an illustration snitched directly from Wikipedia. I know you're not supposed to do that, but I did it anyway. Um, so you know what the circle of fifths is, probably. This implies a, a yet another kind of idea of closeness. There's a closeness of, you might call it key, or co closeness between chords. And it's also a circle, I mean, in, in, in an even more obvious way than, the, uh, than the, the notes are. And then the third circle that's easy to think of is in terms of rhythm, a common way of writing down or notating rhythms in certain uh, in, in certain musical styles, is to actually write it as a circle, so that here you have sort of like dun, 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 dun. So it's just indicating the time of when these things occur around the circle. And here again, there's two notions of distance. There's A being close to B um, in, in time, and then there's the notion of closeness around the circle. That is, each time you've gone around the circle, you're kind of at the same place you were in the previous circle. So in, in, in all of these, we have this kind of circle, this to topology structure, and we have a notion that, that the distance that we want to impose on the space is what's giving us that circle. And so the question then becomes, can we, can we show that these, these things that we know exist in the musical realm are there in our data? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, and the main tool that I, I'm using here 
to look at the topological structure of our clouds of data points are, is this thing called Betty numbers. Um, now, Betty numbers are one way that, that topologists talk about the shape of spaces. Um, it's not the only way, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's one of the major ways. Um, so what, they, what Betty numbers are is there's a series of them. The zeroth one, the first one, tells you how many components you have that are connected. So if we had a group over here and a group over here and a third group down here, we would have a Betty zero of three. So the number of connected components or the number of classes, if you want to think in terms of a classification problem. Um, Betty one, the next of the, the numbers, is how many circles there are, how many holes there are. See, a circle is kind of like, notice this, the thing that defines a circle is that there's something missing in the center, and that's the hole. And so the first of the non-trivial Betty numbers is the, the number of circles, um, and then so on up in the dimension. So, so uh, Betty 2 is the number of three-dimensional holes. Betty 3 is the number of four-dimensional holes, five, et cetera. And so here's an example on the, on the, on the right of the screen here, um, a, a classic calculation in, in algebraic topology is to say that we have one connected component in this, in this torus. So this is an inner, like an inner tube on a, on a car tire here. It's hollow in the center. Um, it's got two circular holes, one around the tube and one around the tube this way. So that, so, that, so that Betty 1 is 2. And then there's that emptiness in the center of the tube, the thing that inf where you, you know, blow the air to inflate the tire, and that's Betty 2 being 1. And so there is a classification of essentially all kinds of surfaces into or by or via their Betty numbers. Now, how do we deal with the second question? And the second question here, what meaning, um, when we have points, each point is, in a certain sense, separate from every other point. So the way that uh, the, the way that this goes, the way the, the strategy that's adopted here is to introduce a new parameter. I'll call it epsilon, and epsilon is a distance. And so what the what the distance will be is. Um, how far apart two points need to be before you identify them or connect them. So, so let's look at, there, there's two extremes, really tiny epsilon, really large epsilon. Those are both uninteresting in, a certain, fundam in certain fundamental ways. And then in between those two is where the, where the action is. So when epsilon's too small, when epsilon's near zero, every point has an infinitesimal little ball about it and doesn't connect to any other points. So there, so how many connected segments are there? This is the up, upper left of those green things there. And basically each point is a separate, its own separate entity. So that be Betty zero is the number of points in the space. And nothing else interesting happens. Betty one, Betty two, Betty three, all the rest of them are, are zero. Let's go to the other extreme. Let's make epsilon really large. In this case, we put a ball this big around each of our points. Well, now, every ball touches every ball, and you end up with the picture on the lower right. So here, it's become uninteresting in a completely different way. Here, what's happened is there's only one thing left. There's only one connected component. So Betty 0 is 1, Betty 1 is 0, and all the rest are 0. Now, you can see from the other two illustrations here, as epsilon grows a little bit, different things start happening. In this one in the upper right here, we have three separate holes that exist in this data. In the one in the lower left, there's only two separate holes. And so we would say that those two are topologically distinct from each other. And the strategy now, in terms of identifying topological structure in large data sets is what's implied by this picture. That is, we're going to take all the points in our space and scan through all the epsilons. So at, at very tiny epsilon, we know what's going to happen. There's as many different, uh, as many different components, separate components as there are points. At the end, 
everything's all joined together and there's only one big blob all connected together. And then in the middle, structures which sort of persist over a given amount of time, or over, sorry, a given amount of epsilon, those are the interesting structures. So the program then is we're going to run to Carlson's website and grab his software. It's great software. It's called Javaplex. And what it does is you throw it a whole bunch of points and you tell it how far apart every point is from every other point. So you give it a big matrix of distances and then it tells you the Betty numbers. And so the question, the, 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 the simple questions that I began asking now are, suppose I give it data that looks like uh, a major scale. Will I see that circle of notes? Suppose I give it data that looks like the circle of fifths. Will I see that circle of fifths pop out in the Betty numbers? I mean, if I, you know, and, and, and I, I was happy with the question when I first started looking at this because either way seems kind of interesting, right? I mean, if I can find it there, then that sort of validates that, that the method is doing what you think it ought to do. And if I can't find it there, that tells you something's really wrong with the way things are set up. So, of course, when I first tried it, I didn't get anything that I liked at all. <laughs> and uh, the reason was I didn't have my uh, distance function correct. I mean, I've already foreshadowed now for you that the distance function is not completely trivial, right? It's got to capture somehow both of these notions of closeness, the, the close for, for individual notes, the closeness in frequency and the closeness over the octaves. So what does that look like? Well, I'll, I, th I think what it looks like is in the next slide. Let me show you what the output of Carlson's code looks like. This is n not any actual thing that I want to show you, but this is the kind of thing you'll see. So on the left of each of these diagrams is epsilon equals zero. On the right of each of these diagrams is epsilon large. And it, the top one is Betty zero, Betty one, Betty two, and if there's more, you just keep going. Uh, uh, other, uh, if, you, if I don't show them, then they're all just zero, nothing happens. So they're uninteresting. And then what you see is as epsilon increases, you see more stuff being transferred from Betty 0 down to Betty 1 where you have the circles. You see stuff being transferred from Betty 1 to Betty 2 where you have two-dimensional voids. And if there were more of these, you'd see stuff being transferred down to three-dimensional voids, four-dimensional voids, etc. So this is the kind of picture we're going to get out of this software and our job will be to interpret those pictures in terms of what we know is going into them. So with only a couple of false starts, here's a way of defining distance between individual notes. So my F and my G here are in Hertz. Um, taking the log two of them sort of mimics the idea that when we perceive frequencies in Hertz, we tend to perceive them as being as distant based on a log scale. Um, this is very much, and if, if you think about what this is, it's essentially a, a translation into MIDI note numbers, um, except it's a scaled version, but it's always between 0 and 1 instead of 0 and 127 or whatever the mi largest MIDI distance would be. Uh, but then, so that's the log two, and then we have this mod, mod function here. Well, this is what gives us the octave reduction. So um, one here is the size of the octave. Were we dealing with MIDI numbers, I would replace that with 12, and then everything in the same octave would be identified. Um, now, for, 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 for technical reasons, you need to also... Uh, the, I'm now looking at the bottom of those those lines there. The distance can't be just the, the, the mod distance. It has to be the smallest distance around. So this is like saying, 
C to C sharp, you want that distance to be the same as C sharp to C. And if you use just that top definition, C to C sharp would be like one semitone, but C sharp to C would be 11 semitones. So what, what this bottom equation is doing is it's just telling you go the shortest distance between the, between the, um, the entities that you have. So that's, that's my distance. Here's the problem that we're looking at. So what I want to put in here is the major scale. So here now I'm doing a very simple thing. I'm taking the frequencies corresponding to the notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, so just C major scale, and th then I input into the program the matrix of distances between all of those notes. So all the program knows is there's eight things and here's how far apart each of those eight things is. And then what it spits out is this picture here. What you have is Betty 0, the number of connected components in the top, Betty 1, the number of circles in the bottom. And what you see is exactly what I've sort of primed you to expect to see here. Um, you see the, you see there's, so there's eight things on the left, two of them go away. Where do they go away? They go away when epsilon gets large enough so that the distance between E and F and B and C, uh, so that epsilon is just slightly larger than that distance. It turns out to be 0.08 about on this scale. Um, the rest of them all collapse at about 0.16. Um, and that's where the whole, that's basically a whole step apart. And when those second group have collapsed, all of them are connected to each other. That's what that long line in the first piece is. And at the same time that happens, the circle appears down here in the bottom. So this is good. For this highly synthetic example, um, at least we can believe that it's showing us something that we know must be there. Um, all right, so let's do it for a slightly, slightly more interesting thing. So here's a piece of music. I, I ripped this off the web. Um, there's the guy where I stole it from. Um, and what I'm going to do is put this sequence of notes into, uh, from this sequence of notes, calculate the distance between every note and every other note, and put that matrix of distances into the JavaPlex program and ask what do we see? What are the Betty numbers of this particular piece when done in this particular simplistic way. In other words, will we see this circle of notes, octave-like structure, come out of it? And indeed, it's probably not much of a surprise, but the answer is yes. So here, Betty 0, Betty 1 again. In this case, there were four things that were a half step apart because of the, the mode that the piece was in. Um, there were three that were a whole step apart. And when they all disappeared at about 0.16 or so, the circle again appears. Now, this is way too simple to be particularly interesting because I've essentially removed all notion of time from the piece. Yes. Well, what I actually put in is the distance matrix between each note and each other note in the, in the, so it's a string of whatever it is, 85 notes or something string of 85 notes and the distance from the first note to the second is this, first note to the third is this, first note to the fourth is this, second to the first is this, second, okay. So just, just in pitch space and so there's no, I, that's wiped out all temporal information. And what I, so what I want to do now is to it'll talk about at least one way that you might stick back some kind, I mean because music without time isn't really music. Um, so here's one way to go about doing this. So let's imagine that our uh, sequence of notes is, I'll just label them with this F1, F2, F3, F4, so my string of 85 notes like that maybe. And then let's form them into, for example, two vectors. So the first one is the first pair, the second one is the second and third, the third, okay, so you see the, the way the, so, so we're taking it and we're putting it into successive pairs. 
overlapping successive pairs. So, so that this set of pairs now represents what's another string of data. And it represents the first string of data and some information about what notes follow what other notes. Not all the information, but some of it. So now we have uh, a slightly larger set of entities. The, our entities now are the pairs F1, F0, F1, F1, F2, F2, F3, etc. through all of those. Input those distances and we get a more interesting set of, of, uh, of uh, well, Betty numbers. So here again, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 and beyond were all 0. So here we have uh, a, a considerably more complex uh, set of, well, information from that exact same piece. Um, We can do, uh, instead of just pairs of embedding, we can embed th in triplets or in quadruplets. Or I mean, n nothing stops us from making larger sets of embedding so as to capture more of the sequential information. And what you get out of those things is l essentially longer sets and, and more elements in them, longer sets of such pictures. Um, we can do the same kind of thing now in our other realms, if you will, in the other, uh, uh, so if we're looking for the, at the circle of fifths, we need a notion of distance between chords. Now it might seem that that's obviously reducible to distances between notes, but it wouldn't be so obvious once you started trying to think about exactly how to do that. And the reason is that when you're talking about, say, the T time delay embedding, it's perfectly natural that, uh, say you had the note C followed by D and then D followed by E. It's perfectly natural that, that um, let me do that again. Suppose you had C followed by D and then D followed by C. You don't want the distance between those two objects to be zero because they're not the same thing. They're, they're in temporally moving in a different way. On the other hand, in a chord, you might well want to, be, to identify the inversions of a chord with themselves. In order to capture that kind of notion, you can essentially parlay that earlier notion of distance between um, individual notes into a notion of distance between chords. And essentially, the approach that uh, we took here was to uh, look at, all, essentially take all the permutations of these guys, calculate the distance just as you would normally think of doing a distance, and then find which one's smallest and use that. Um, the reason for doing this, I, I mean, it, I, I can sort of make an argument for why that's justified, but the reason I actually did it is because when you do that, it allows you to, that notion of distance sh will show you the circle of fifths in a, in, a, in a chord pattern, and other notions of distance won't. So I'm now treading on really, I mean, I'm in danger of making a circular argument here. I choose my distance function because I know what I want the answer to my problem to be. So I acknowledge that potential for circularity, um, but I don't know how to get around it. Um, so suppose we do this anyway. Um, l first, let's just do something totally synthetically. Let me manufacture the circle of fifths. I'm going to take a triplet of notes that's C major, a triplet that's G major, a triplet that's D major, all the way around the all the way around the circle of fifths till it comes back and input the distance matrix corresponding to those events as given by the distance function that I just proposed to you on the last slide. And here's what you get. So you the the top two are exactly what you would expect. That is to say, all the chords 
are uh, distant from their neighbors by a certain amount. Once epsilon passes that amount, they all are connected together. And at that same moment, the Betty one number appears there. That is indeed the circle of fifths. Now, there's also some other stuff that happens here in these bottom two charts. And it really wasn't obvious to me what those things, I mean, I mean where, where do they come from? Why are they there? Certainly if I just naively imagine that I'm drawing lines in Euclidean space connecting things, I don't see them. So where, where are they coming from? Why, I mean, why are they, why are they there? Um, oh, okay, before I go on to that question, we can do the same thing now for something that's more like real music. Here is uh, a Bach chorale, which is nice because it's always got four note chords. At every, at every moment there's four voices sounding simultaneously. So we take the collection of four note uh, entities, we calculate the distance between them all, and we can dr again draw the barcode for these, that is the set of Betty numbers and the associated epsilons. And you see the piece of music is su significantly more complex than the, than the uh, simplistic just go around the, the circle of fifths, and indeed this piece does not go around the circle of fifths. So these are other kinds of circles that you're seeing here in the Betty 1 uh, number here. Um, this, this is just the verbal explanation for what we see in this kind of piece. And again, now I'm just showing you when you, when you do these now time delay embeddings, you get a lot more of the same kind of stuff. And now, now you've got the, the, the pattern here, right? I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but now let's do the same thing. Let's find out what the right distance function is to represent rhythmic data. Let's apply that first in, an, in, a, in a very simple case like this one here. Uh, okay, there it is, the necklace or the circle that we have in, in terms of rhythm and the, the, the particular values of epsilon at which those those Piece, those elements join together and in which they join to form that one connected circle. And then we can do that for more complex rhythms, for rhythms that are again time delay embedded. Um, and so here's some more pictures. Um, when I, I, John mentioned I was in Turkey, so when I gave this talk a couple weeks ago in, in, in Turkey, I, I needed to have something about Turkish music in there. So I, I ran the simulation for uh, one of the Turkish, uh, the Ushak improvisation, which is a particular makam. And they look similar but slightly different. And the, and the interesting difference here, I think, is that because the notes aren't all uh, locked into a grid on like, like our notes in 12-tone equal temperament, um, they, the epsilon values at which things change uh, aren't, there's not those long strings of things that all have change at once for particular epsilon values. So my intention here in showing you these three different little uh, toruses is suppose that our space is, is, is that, that image. Now we might have different kinds of uh, structures on that space that live on that space. One possibility is the piece occupies the whole space, and we would then anticipate seeing the, well, the, the Betty numbers as given by that full torus. On the other hand, it's very possible that you're not moved, and in fact most music you would expect would not move over the whole space. So what you would move over, perhaps, is just around on the surface. Or you might move so that you go around one of the one of the possible circles here, or like the, on the right hand side there, or you might go around this or the long way. So the answer to your question is we're in these 
I, I mean, this is a, a gross oversimplification of the actual spaces, right? Because they have lots of circles, and there's many. It's 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 a. I mean, you can't really draw the the, the entities from which which these are. But the point is, what you've got is this sort of, if you think of it here, this red surface. And then the actual piece of music that you're analyzing occupies a small piece of that red surface and traverses only a small portion of it. Like the, the little green sections there traverse only a small part of the full torus. Um, one of the things I've, I've been interested in and, and, and is can we, can we talk about what these spaces actually look like. I mean, these Betty numbers correspond to certain kinds of surfaces, right? I mean, the torus was an example that is easy to use, so I, so, so I give it. Um, it, it can, we t can we talk about what these, the shape of the spaces that we're seeing in these simulations actually are? Um, so this is where you have to go out and find a topologist to to collaborate with. So I, I owe, well, a lot of what I've been saying. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, certainly m m th this slide and the next couple to my co-author, Ryan Budney, who's from, uh, well, from the University of Victoria. So he he's um, responsible for much of the mathematization of this. Partly because I'm not capable of doing it, um, I'm not going to drag you through this, th this um, <laughs> the details of this slide. What, what we're talking about here is writing down formulas to describe the surfaces that those Betty numbers imply. And there's several different kinds of things. And there's some generic properties that you can derive that have to do with how these spaces relate to each other. Um, there's a whole terminology in topology about such spaces. And all of these that we, we are referring to have this S1 in it. The S1 is nice and simple. That's the circle. Um, S2, when you see it, is a sphere. Just the surface of a sphere, not the solid sphere. The surface of a sphere. And what we, what we find is that all of our using these various distance functions that that we've uh, justified in, in essence by experiment, using these various distance functions, we come up with collections of these S1, Sn spaces connected together in particular ways. Um, here's a, a couple of examples. Um, I won't drag you, th drag you through these. Um, some of the earlier examples show you the whole space. So when I, when I fabricated the, the major scale and did the Betty numbers of that major scale, that was encompassing essentially the whole space of those one-dimensional, one uh, well, no time delay embedding. Um, as you get larger, as the space gets larger and the problem becomes more complicated, then essentially you begin, as soon as you have more than, well, three or four dimensions, then y y you, you stop, a any piece of music that we've analyzed stops occupying a large proportion of the space and you begin looking like those little green segments on the torus in the earlier slide, rather than looking at the, like the whole space itself. So, the, so, so now I'm going to try to return to your question. I mean, I don't honestly know the answer in specific cases. But you asked, what do those little, what do those little lines in the S2 and the S3 correspond to? And I think what they correspond to now is, if we go to a picture like this, they correspond to, now our actual surface here is many of these toruses, imagine them all like glued together in some complicated way. And what the piece is doing is going around some of those little toruses that make up our complex piece and not going around m most of the others. That's what we're seeing in those pictures, I think. And that explains why 
this is the these the Betty numbers give you what is effectively a characterization of the piece. So, so what what what, what am I actually saying here? Well, I started out with this vision that, of course, is completely n not happening. Of of let's imagine we have the space of all possible melodies. Here's all of the you know, big data question, right? And then wh what I want to do is apply this notion to find out over this, this corpus and this other corpus and this other corpus of, of music, what can we say about the, the structure and the relationships between these various uh, pieces of, or, or, or corpuses of music in the same sort of way that, that, the, that the original motivation was we're sitting and looking at all photographs in R6 million. Okay, that's not going to happen. But what 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 we did do is we once we started looking more carefully at the at what's needed here is we ran pro across this problem that we need to be able to specifically and exactly say what we mean by distance. Distance is not just Euclidean distance here, because you if if you use Euclidean distance, I mean I know that's the first thing you try, right? If you use Euclidean distance, none of the stru musical structures that you know are sh show up. They're not there. So, so that tells you Euclidean distance is the wrong thing to be using here. And by picking toy examples, you know, the major scale or the thing that goes around the circle of fifths or something, we can verify that at least the distance measures that we've chosen are sensible in some way or other. And then we've essentially begun to scratch the surface on what you can actually do with this now. Um, I mean, there's a, a lot of things we haven't done. So now it's the time to fess up to some of the things that I've swept under the rug this whole time. Um, I'm talking about symbolic data. Everything I've done so far is with symbolic data. My natural inclination is to want to use audio rather than note data. And, I mean, honestly, I don't know what the right distance function is to be able to recover the structures from an audio rendition of the major scale. There must be one. I mean, musically, you know there must be one. But I don't know what, what it is. I would love to know that. Um, the, the, the related to, the, your que to your musical question, and what makes that musical question somewhat tricky to answer, is that when you have these uh, large conglomerations of high Betty numbers, it's extremely difficult to just go back and say, okay, this corresponds to this shape. I mean, I sort of oversimplified things to say things are all circles and all toruses. They're, they can be very complicated shapes. And so there's actually two pieces of that question. One is, what is the geometric entity that the Betty numbers correspond to? And given that geometric entity, then, how are we traversing it? So the reason I don't have that picture that you're asking for is, is because I can't do the first part, not because I can't do the second part. I think if I could do the first part, the second part should be relatively easy. Um, do we really have the right metrics for the thing we're doing? I think yes. When I was first doing this, I was less sure. But the more I do it, the, uh, wow, who knows? May, I mean, there's other possibilities than the ones I've, I've mentioned here. Um, a fascinating question in terms of the rhythm pattern is the observation that we often have rhythmic patterns occurring in hierarchies. And it feels to me that this method ought to be able to locate those hierarchies of rhythmic perception rather than simply one pattern, one rhythmic pattern. In other words, it ought to be able to tell you, oh, this piece is in 4-4, four, four, not just this piece has a cycle 
of size this. Um, yeah, so here's an interesting idea. Maybe, m maybe finding the actual corresponding structures in the topology space is just too difficult to do. Even so, that doesn't mean this analysis is, is useless because there is the possibility that these could be used as a sort of in, a, in classification or a, as I use the word here, in segmentation. That is, you want to say, okay, these pieces are alike are like each other in the sense that their Betty numbers have certain similar properties. You don't need to actually know what the space is in order to be able to use that information. So this is very much a data, you know, this is what someone who loves data would say, right? We don't need to know what that topological entity that is represented by the data is. We'll just use this condensation of the data. Um, and it's, it's, it's a significant condensation, right? I mean, from hundreds or thousands of points, you go down to a handful of Betty numbers and the epsilons at which they occur. So it's a significant reduction in s size. Um, so another way to say this is the Betty numbers might be nice features to extract from the audio data. Um, and then there's a couple of technical things that I would like to... Um, be able to work out that I don't necessarily feel I should drag you through. So I hope that was useful to you. Um. <laughs>